Hello and welcome to this video on reporting structural equation analyses. My name is Christian Geiser. On this channel, I present weekly statistics tutorials, usually related to multivariate statistical methods, including structural equation modeling, latent class analysis, and multi-level modeling. If this is something that interests you, then please subscribe to this channel. Also, don't forget to hit the like button in case you like this video. I often get asked by people who run structural equation models or confirmatory factor analyses or path analyses about what you should report when you um, are done with your analyses. So what are the things that you should uh, put in your paper or report of such types of analyses? And so in this video here, I want to give you some um, general guidelines for what I think should typically be included in such a report. First of all, what you should always include is a clear description of your model. I see it very often when I read papers that it's not clear to me what exactly the model looked like that people were actually estimating in their analyses. So it doesn't become clear from the description. And there are different ways to do this. One way that is um, a good step or a good part of this description would be to show a picture of the model. So meaning a path diagram that often already clarifies the basic structure of the model, the variables, what types of indicators were used in the model, which parameters were estimated and so on. But then in addition to that, you should also include a very clear description of which parameters in the model were fixed, for example, for identification, were there any loadings that were, for example, fixed for identification, any other parameters that were constrained, how many free parameters did you estimate, what were the degrees of freedom of the model, that all makes it clear to people what the model exactly looked like, and then it becomes uh, easier to replicate. And that is something that should always be the goal, that somebody who reads your paper is able to fit the exact same model with their own data to see if they can replicate the results. Also, you should include a description of what types of indicators you used for latent variable models in case you have multiple indicator models, such as confirmatory factor analysis or a structural equation model with latent variables, oftentimes I see that people do not include a clear description of what exactly they used as indicators. Did they use the items? So were the uh, analyses done at the item levels where the item level where the items were directly used as indicators of the latent variables? Or did they use item parcels or meaning sum scores or aggregates of different items? Because that also makes a difference for how you would estimate the model. So another thing that's often missing from a report is what estimator was used. For example, was maximum likelihood estimation used, assuming that the indicators were continuous or quasi-continuous, or was an estimator used for ordinal data, such as, for example, um, uh, w um, or weighted least squares estimation. Um, such as available in M plus for ordinal data, what was used as the input was a covariance matrix analyzed, or was it a matrix of polychoric correlations with item level data, for example, those are all things that need to be clarified up front. So what did the model look like? What was used as um, the input, so to say, what were the indicators that should be made 100% clear. Also, a list of the variables should be included at least in an appendix so that people know what were the items or the scales, where can I find more information about, for example, item wording and so on. You should also include at the beginning of your uh, results section, you should include descriptive statistics for the observed variables, again, so that people can replicate the findings, for example, based on a correlation matrix and the means of the variables and or a matrix of polychoric correlations if you use ordinal data in your analyses so that, again, the analyses become transparent and replicable. Also um, useful is to say something about assumptions and whether they were violated or not violated in your case. For example, when you use maximum likelihood estimation with structural equation modeling and continuous variables, then it is assumed that the data are multivariate normal. Now we know that in practice, oftentimes 
this assumption is violated to some degree. So then it would also be good to say something about the degree to which this assumption was violated. For example, you could give measures of skewness and kurtosis. You could say whether you used some kind of adjustment in your model estimation. For example, did you use robust maximum likelihood estimation to account for non-normality or did you maybe use um, bootstrapping, for example. So all that should also be part of the report. And then when you're uh, finally ready to um, report the actual model results, then the first thing that you should report is um, some indication of the model fit. So, and one of the um, classic measures or one of the measures that we should always report is the chi-square test of model fit along with the degrees of freedom and p-value. Now, I see very often in practice that people omit the chi-square test because they argue it's not relevant, my sample was so large, and any model would be rejected by the chi-square and stuff like that, and they only report fit indices, such as, for example, the root mean square error of approximation, the confirmer, the comparative fit index and indices like that. And in my opinion, that is not, not a good strategy because those fit indices we know now from various simulation studies have their own problems and they're not a good replacement or they're not an alternative to a chi-square test of model fit that tells us very clearly when something is wrong with a model. So in my opinion, you should always give that chi-square test of model fit degrees of freedom and p-value no matter how large your sample size, because this test is still informative. It is more informative, in my opinion, than a lot of the fit statistics, especially with large samples, because with large samples, the fit statistics tend to look better for any model, and they tend to become less sensitive to model misspecifications. In any case, you should definitely say something about model fit. If the model fit um, supports your model, if it doesn't support your model, maybe you have also multiple models that you can statistically compare. For example, you might have nested models in a situation where, for example, you test something like different levels of measurement equivalence across time or across groups, then those models might be here hierarchically nested and you could maybe conduct chi-square difference tests to compare different models statistically. So then those types of model comparisons should be included. Also, you can give um, detailed fit statistics. For example, you can, could give the largest standardized residual from the residual covariance matrix to indicate whether there was any big discrepancy for any kind of covariance, for example, between your um, model and the data. You could also say something about whether there were any large modification indices, maybe in case the fit wasn't so good. And so at the end of that, you should make a clear statement about why you accepted or did not accept a particular model so that it's clear to people how you made your decision, why you think that a model was uh, good enough, so to say, to um, proceed for reporting the uh, model results and parameter estimates for this model. So a section on model fit is very important in a report on structural equation modeling. Then once you um, have made a decision for a specific model that you think appropriately represents your data, then you would report the parameter estimates. And what I see here oftentimes is that people omit a lot of the parameter estimates. So the report is incomplete. We don't know what all the values were for all the free parameters of the model. And in my opinion, um, if possible, at least all the free parameters should be reported along with their standard errors and ideally also confidence intervals so that we can see something about the precision of the estimates and also whether they were statistically significant. Remember that from a confidence interval, you can also infer statistical significance. For example, a 95% confidence interval, if it does not include zero, then tells you that the parameter was significant at the 0.05 alpha level. And so that is always useful to include as well as other measures of effect size. Sometimes it's useful to include also standardized measures of effect size, such as a Cohen's D measure, for example, a correlation measure, and so on, so that it becomes clear to people whether the results were practically meaningful, meaning practically significant in terms of the size of a given effect. Now, since there are often many parameter estimates in SEM, 
it's most useful to report those in a table. It's most, so to say, efficient where you have more space in a table. It's more organized than putting all the parameter estimates into a path diagram. Typically, that doesn't work super well. For some models, it, it does if they're not too big. But usually a table is better because then you in, can include the parameter estimates, the standard errors. You can include a column with a confidence interval, maybe even a p-value and the standardized estimate so that you can report both unstandardized standardized and standardized estimates in a table. If it really becomes too much um, to, be, to um, include in your paper because it's a large model, then you could at least um, put such a table into an online appendix. Most journals nowadays have the option of having online supplemental materials. And so then you could at least refer to such a table with all the parameters and then only maybe discuss the most important parameter estimates in the paper, but include a complete table still in online supplemental materials. So that would be um, very useful to include so that, again, the whole model is transparent. All the parameter estimates are there. You should also then say something about whether all the parameter estimates were proper or whether there were any improper parameter estimates, whether there were any issues with standard errors. For example, did some parameters have high standard errors indicating potential problems with the model? All that should also be reported. And then at the end, you should make a clear statement about whether the model results support your hypotheses. This is also something that I very often miss. So oftentimes people get so caught up in their structural equation model and all the things that um, are, are there to report that at the end they get lost and they don't make a clear statement at the end whether their model actually supported their um, theoretical hypotheses. And, um, then it's not clear what does the model actually tell us. Does it support your theory or does it not support the theory? Um, what is the deal with the model? So you should end the results section or at least in the discussion section, you should have, um, you should make a statement about um, what kinds of hypotheses that you had a priori were supported here by the results or are, are so to say, um, supported versus not supported, and then you can give directions for future research. You can also address in the discussion section um, suboptimal fits. Sometimes we just have a model and um, the model just didn't fit so well. We didn't really know how to modify the model um, post hoc and post hoc modifications to a model can also be problematic. So then at the end, you could um, give some ideas for how maybe a model might be modified, improved in future research. If you did modify the model based on um, the fit indices or fit statistics for the same data, then you should also make this very clear that um, the final model that you accepted deviated from the model that you initially proposed. So you should be very transparent about what your a priori model was versus the final model that then you gave the results for, because oftentimes people modify their model because they, the initial model does not fit. Then that should be made transparent because when we do post hoc model modifications um, based on the same data, then those should always be cross validated. So to say in future with future new data, and that would then be a goal for future research. I hope that this um, general overview of what to include in a report of structural equation models was useful for you. Of course, I couldn't address every single detail here in this presentation, but I hope it gave you a general idea. And um, again, if you like this type of uh, material that I present here, then please subscribe to this channel. Also uh, leave a comment in the comment section if you have any additional ideas on what should be reported or what should not be reported in an SEM. Check out the description for additional resources and I'll see you next week.